because of the goodness of God that we are here this morning. Don't want to hold you long, but I do want the hold to be strong. I'll let you know when to start timing me. <laughs> if you will, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. The text is chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. If you don't mind, let us stand, those of you that, that are able, for the reading of the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. If you're there, say amen. amen. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. You may be seated in the presence of our God. I want to preach as a spiritual guy with the text that was assigned to me by Dr. Carruthers. I thought he was my friend. Hands, knees, and feet in the race by faith. Hands, knees, and feet in the race by faith. First of all, I want to piggyback off what Dr. Bruinton said earlier. We are running this race by faith. It does not matter who finishes first. It does not matter who finishes last. All that matters is you finish. You don't need to run my race. I don't need to run your race. You don't need to tell me how to run my race. I don't need to tell you how to run your race. But we all need to run the race. And when we run this race, we are running this race by faith. We're not running this race by our physical ability because it's not a physical race. It is a spiritual race. And when we run a long race, we've got to run this race with God's grace. But along with the grace, I'm going to need some faith. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse 1, now faith is the substance. Okay, y'all missed that. Faith is the substance. Understand something. We go to the Greek sometimes to understand words. But sometimes, Dr. Carruthers, the English is just as good as the Greek. Look at what the Hebrew author is saying. Faith is the substance. That's a compound word. That word sub means under. That word stance means to stand. You see, a submarine is a ship under the ocean. A subway is a train under the ground. Well, faith is that which is under you that gives substance. It gives credence. It gives reality to the race you are trying to run. So faith is that under me that's holding me up when I can't hold myself up. Faith is that thing that's under me, that's sustaining me when I can't sustain myself. Faith is that thing under me that helps me to make it when I don't know how I'm going to make it. I got to run this race by faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen are not made by the things which doth appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than came, by which he attained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift, and he being dead, yet speak.
speaketh. How? By faith. You got to have the faith it takes to run this race. When we look at faith as an acrostic, forsaking all, I trust him. But many of us allow fear to cancel out our faith. Fear is false evidence appearing real. When you run this race, you've got to give in to your faith and not give in to your fear because fear will cause you not to finish the race, but faith will help you to finish the race. And as we look at the text, as we peruse this pericope and expostulate on this exposition, hopefully you can leave with an explanation because we look at the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is showing the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. It is showing the superiority of Jesus over Moses, over the sacrifice of Christ when you compare it to the sacrifices of animals under the old covenant. It is showing how Christ is superior Christ has set up a covenant that is established upon better promises. And when we think about the fact that we are in a better situation than they were under the old covenant, that ought to motivate us to run this race by faith. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, don't tell me how to run. You run your race and I run my race. But we all trust in God's grace. Now watch this. Watch this. I don't want to deal with the verses before because I'm trying to get to my text. Before I get to verse 12, he's already told them to consider the saints who've gone before them. In verse number one. And then before I even get to my text, he's already told them in verse 2, consider the Savior who's gone before you and he's prepared the way. He was not only the author of the race, but he will be the finisher of the race. Before I get to my text, he's already said in about verse 4, you have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Before I get to my text, he's already said in verse 5 that you need to consider your sonship. He says, my sons, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. I like that when he says, my sons. Dr. Brewerton dealt with that beautifully. Now, I don't know how you all grew up, but my mother and my father, they believe in whoopings. I didn't say whippings. I said whoopings. We got whooped. And I don't mean those little cute spankings. My mama could have been a quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. I'm sorry, Carolina Panthers. Because my mama could hit you with a shoe 20 feet away. My mama believed in the extension cord, the switches, and the belt. I love to get whooped with the belt because the belt didn't hurt as much as the switches and the extension cord. And the bad thing about it is when we got whipped, mama would make us go get the switch. And you better not come back with a small switch. Because then she'll make you go get another one. And then she will intertwine them and whoop you with both of them. But here's the thing. My mama didn't whip other folks' kids without the parent permission. Okay, this side a little slow. Let me go over here. Mama 
didn't whip other folks' kids without the parent permission. Okay, y'all woke. Y'all didn't hang out late last night. But the only reason that mama and daddy put their hands on their children is because we were their children. Oh, y'all missing your shout. If God is chastising you, if God is disciplining you, then that's the opportunity that you should take to shout and say, thank you, Jesus, because the only reason God is putting his hand on you is because you are his child. But church folk don't know when to shout. Watch this. And then he says, consider the shame in about verse 8. Brewington dealt with that because without the chastisement of the Lord, then you are like orphans. You are fatherless. You are considered bastards. But because I'm his child, like a good coach, he's grooming me. He's training me. He's disciplining me because he knows I'm in a race. He knows I got to get in shape. And so sometimes God got to chastise me. Sometimes God got to whip me. Sometimes God got to discipline me. Sometimes God got me running sprints in the middle of the night when I don't feel like running sprints. Sometimes he got me doing push-ups when I don't feel like doing push-ups. Sometimes he got me doing squats when I don't feel like doing squats. Sometimes he got me on a diet when I don't feel like being on a diet. Why is God doing that to me? By faith he's trying to get me ready for the race. I'm trying to get to my ticks. And then in verse 9 it causes me to be in subjection to God. And then in verses 10 and 11, it's for my sanctity. It's for my profit. I become a partaker of his holiness and he yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now when I get to my text in verse 12, he says, wherefore and wherefore will let you know what is there for. Three times he makes a transition in the text docs. At the first verse, he says, well for. Then when he gets to the 12th verse, he transitions to another thought. He says, well for. Then when he gets to the 28th verse, he says, well for again. He must have been a Church of Christ preacher because he at least had three points. He says, well for. Now, if you want three points for this sermon, the first point is lift up the hands which hang down. The second point is you better strengthen those feeble knees. And the last point is you better learn how to use your feet if you want to finish this race. See, when you run it, you better learn how to use your hands Preach, Jerry. You better learn how to use your knees and you better learn how to use your feet. Watch this. In the midst of being disciplined by God, Brother Carruthers, in the midst of being chastised by God, in the midst of being scourged by God, in the midst of being trained by God like a good coach, while God whipping you, the Hebrew author said, lift up your hand. See, church folk ain't ready for this. 
Listen, I, I ain't got time to talk about the different hands in the Bible. Bearing hands, betraying hands, sinning hands, unwashed hands, hitting hands, stretched hands, working hands, bound hands, bloody hands, wicked hands, clapping hands, violent hands, guilty hands. But in our text, the Hebrew author says, in the midst of of being disciplined by the Lord, you need to have the posture of praise. Not hanging hands, not discouraged hands, not depressed hands, not doubting hands, but if God is your father, and you are his child, and you're being disciplined by the Lord while you're running this Christian race. What you ought to do in the midst of what you're going through, you need to lift up your hands. As a matter of fact, Paul said it like this. He said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I think he's talking to me. I think I need to lift up my hand. See, when you run this race, when Jesse Owens won those medals in World War II, when he, was, when he ran, you know what he would do? He would lift. When Carl Lewis used to run, he would lift. Hussein Boats, when he would run, he would. See, you can't run this race with your hand, I can't get no help in here. You can't run this race with your hands by your side. You better run this race with your hands up or you will never. And we have allowed the enemy to make us keep our hands. Paul in 1 Timothy 2, verse 7 and 8, Paul is making an, op he's making an application based on observation. In other words, Paul is taking the idea of lifting hands to metaphorically talk about holiness. But Paul, where are you getting this application from? Because the first century church was a church that praised God with their hands in the air, waving them from side to side like they just don't. You better lift to your neighbor, say, neighbor, you better lift up your, everybody in here who think the Lord is your father and Jesus, will you lift up your hands? while you try to run this race and just wave them unto the Lord because you better learn how to lift up your hands. But secondly, if you're going to run this race, oh, you can't do it with arthritic knees. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you better get knee replacement surgery by faith. Because when you run this race, those feeble knees by implication, the Hebrew author is saying, by faith, God will make your knees strong. Now, now understand something about the knees. The Bible talks about bearing knees, weak knees, sleeping knees, preventing knees, praying knees. But I like worshiping knees. Now y'all do understand that the knees, metaphorically speaking, deal with the posture of prayer, but also the posture of worship. Okay, your, your church folk ain't ready for this now. When you go back and you read in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 18 and 19, Jehoshaphat, when they got ready to worship they bowed and kneeled. Okay, y'all ain't ready for this. But when they got ready to praise, they got up and shouted with a loud. 
if you going to run this race, not only must you learn how to lift up your hands, you better learn how to raise your knees because you can't run this race like this. You better ask God to metaphorically speak and strengthen your knee so you can lift your knees when you run. I read somewhere that God has given him a name that is exalted above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall You better learn how to praise him by lifting your hands. You better learn how to worship him by strengthening your knees. When it comes to knees, we need more neology and less theology. And then finally, he talks about those feet running in the straight path. I mean, the feet are so important to running the race. The Bible talks about wash feet and running feet and covered feet and uncovered feet and bare feet and lame feet and dress feet and diseased feet and evil feet, abiding feet, trampling feet. Uh, the Bible talks about testifying feet, peaceful feet, beautiful feet. And I read somewhere how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel and bring the tidings of good news. And then the Bible talks about prepared feet. Ephesians 6, 15. The Bible says having your feet showed, watch this, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When I was in the service as a soldier, the last thing you put on to indicate that you were prepared to go to battle, you put on your boots. And when you put on your boots, that means you were ready. If you're going to run this race, you better learn how to lift up your hands. You better learn how to strengthen your knees. And you better learn how to move your feet. You cannot just sit on the log of do nothing and whittle on the stick of do even less. If you're going to run this race, you better use everything God has given you. And when I look at Jesus, when he died on the cross, I see hands and feet and even knees in the plan of salvation. Because when they marched him down the Via Dolorosa and the cross got heavy, he fell down to his knees and the folk started crying for him. And the Bible says he went just a little bit further. And then they took him up the hill and they laid him low and stretched him wide. Watch this. They put nails in his hands and nails in his feet and they lifted up that cross. And I heard him say, if I be lifted up. I'll draw all men unto me. Don't you see that hands, knees, and feet played a part in the salvation of all humankind because he died on the cross but got up early Sunday morning with all power in the palm of his hand saying, can't no grave hold me down. And then understand something. This thing is a relay race. I mean, we cannot forget the S.R. Cassius who passed the batons to the G.P. Bowsers and the Marsha Keebles who passed it to Levi Kennedy who passed on to R.N. Hogan and John Henry Clay and don't forget the living legends today, Dr. R.C. Wells, Dr. Jack 
Evan Senior, Dr. Eugene Lawton, Dr. W.F. Washington, they are passing the baton on to the next generation. And God, throughout the generations of humankind, has always passed the baton down from one generation to the next. Abraham passed it on to Isaac, and Isaac passed it on to Jacob, and Jacob passed it to Judah, and Judah gave it to Perez, and Perez gave it to Ezra, Ezra gave it to Aram, Abinadab, Nias, and Salmon, Boaz Obed, then Jesse gave it to David, and David gave it to Solomon. Solomon gave it to Rehoboam. Rehoboam gave it to Abiah. Abiah gave it to Asa. Asa gave it to Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat gave it to Joram, who gave it to Osiah, who gave it to Joathan, who gave it to Achaz. Ezekiel gave it to Manassas. Manassas gave it oh, to Joram. Joram gave it to Jeconiah. Zechariah gave it to Salathiel. So let the L gave it to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel gave it to Eliakim. Eliakim gave it to Aza. Aza gave it to Achan. Achan gave it to Elihu. Elihu gave it to Eliezer. Eliezer gave it to Achan. Achan gave it to Mathen. Mathen gave it to Jacob. Jacob gave it to Joseph. Joseph married Mary. And Mary gave it to the finisher of our faith, Jesus! And let me say this. Let me say this. And you know, when you think about it, it reminds me of the mutt. And you know, when I think about the goodness of God, I'm like that mutt who couldn't keep it to himself. There was his husband and wife who would raise blue ribbon show dogs. And every year, they had worn 10 years straight. Nobody in the county could beat them. And one day, during a rainstorm, they heard, <laughs> and they thought maybe one of the blue ribbon show dogs had gotten out. And they went to the door, and it was a mutt, flea bitten, mangy, ugly, nasty mutt. And that mutt looked up at that man with sadness in his eye, and the wife looked at the husband and said, Don't you think about it bringing that mutt in this house. But he said, baby, the mutt needs us. She said, now you bring that mutt, he's going to break your heart. I know you, you're going to get attached. And that mutt going to run off because mutts are not faithful to anybody. And against her judgment, he took that mutt, cleaned that mutt up, got all the ticks and fleas off of that mutt. And over time, that mutt's hair began to grow back. The mutt started looking healthy, and the man and the mutt became inseparable. As a matter of fact, that mutt fell in love with the man, and the man fell in love with the mutt, and all the other show dogs were jealous of the mutt because everywhere he went, there was the mutt, and the mutt would walk by all those blue ribbon show dogs with his head in the air, like, yeah, I got it like that. And when they would watch the animal channel, the mutt would be right there next to the old man watching the animal channel. The man even had a bed in the bedroom for the mutt. He loved that mutt. And every day he would come home, the mutt would meet him at the door. But one day, he came home and the mutt didn't meet him. He looked all over the house for the mutt, couldn't find the mutt. His wife came home and said, what you doing? He said, I'm looking for the mutt. She said, I told you. You know how sisters can be sometimes. I told you. Weeks went by, and he was inconsolable. You know, Dr. Garrett, because he loved that mutt. And one day he was sitting in front of the television, and it was storming outside, he and his wife, and he was watching the Animal Channel, reminiscing about that mutt. And all of a sudden he heard, hey, hey, hey. and he said, no, it can't be. It can't be. And his wife looked at him and said, let it go, honey, let it go. He went to the door, and guess who it was? The mutt. And that mutt jumped all up in the man's face, started licking him all over his face, all over his mouth. The man was hugging the mutt, and the mutt was trying to wiggle to get her loose. And finally, the mutt ran off around the corner. He said, mutt, where you going? And then a few seconds later, when the mutt came back, he had a whole bunch of mutts with him. 
And the mutt said, I had to tell everybody. I met somebody who can love and save anybody. And when I think about what God has done for me, I got to raise my hand. I got to lift my knee. I got to remove my feet because God been too good to me. Now, who wants to come to the Lord? When I think about that mutt, I think about me. I'm just a nobody. I got to tell everybody I met somebody who can save any. That's why I got to lift my hands. That's why I lift my knees. That's why I move my feet. Because God been too good to me. Who needs the Lord this morning? Maybe there's somebody here today. You need the Lord in the pardon of your sins. You need to come by faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You need to repent of your sins. Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and 5. The Lord said, I tell you nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And you need to confess with your mouth the sweetest name on human tongue, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Then baptism, not sinner's prayer. Baptism, not the mourner's bench. Baptism, not receiving Jesus in your heart. But baptism, is the point where God saves you and adds you to the church of Christ. Mark 16, 16, Jesus preached this sermon when he was resurrected from the grave. He said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And if you're a child of God and you just need prayer, now is the time to come. And when the Lord saves you, he doesn't add you to any church. He adds you to the one we can read about on the pages of inspiration. I'm old school with a new school twist. I believe in the gospel. And I call it his church because the Bible calls it his church. If you're going to build it, let me build it for you. And tell me, you tell me whose church it is. If you build a church, don't you need a foundation? 1 Corinthians 3.11, other foundations can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation of the church is Christ. If you're going to build a church, don't you need walls? Isaiah 26 and verse 1, he's appointed walls for our salvation. So the walls of the church is Christ. If you're going to build a church, don't you need a roof? Don't you need a head over it? Colossians 1 and verse 18, he's the head of the body, the church. So the roof of the head of the church is Christ. If you're going to build a church, don't you need windows to get light into the church? John 8 and verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. So the light in the church is Christ. If you're going to build a church, don't you need a door so you can have access or entrance into the church? John 10 and verse 7, he said, I am the door to the sheep. So the foundation of the church is Christ. If the walls in the church is Christ, if the roof of the head of the church is Christ, if the windows of the light in the church is Christ, if the door of the entrance into the church is Christ, somebody tell me what you're going to call it. Thank you. And in the church of Christ, we better learn how to lift up our hands, raise our knees, and start running for Jesus. Let us stand as we're led in a song of encouragement. If you need prayer, now is the time to come. If you've come to the lectureship and you're not a member of the Church of Christ, we'll be happy to study with you and talk to you more about Jesus, his plan of salvation, because we love you here.